Hey everybody. Okay, so I just got done doing the video about Hellfire. This is another video. It's all connected. It's all from the same actual documentary. So this one's about uh, God and his graciousness. So let's check this out. This is God's undeserved activity of kindness doing for me what I cannot do for myself. I think we all benefit from God's benevolence in a general way. Uh, the Bible says he causes the rain and the sun to fall on the just and the unjust. Even Hitler was allowed to enjoy a, a beautiful sunset. But it's only through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ that a person goes from being an enmity with God under God's curse, under God's wrath, to a place of safety and blessing and peace. Uh, the Bible calls that reconciliation. And we have been reconciled to God while we were his enemies. But while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How can God pardon a wicked man and still be a righteous God? Paul answers that question. He answers this problem in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is the payment of a ransom, of a price, so that a slave, a criminal, a prisoner might go free. Well, Christ paid that ransom. And some people have believed wrongly that somehow Christ paid a ransom to the devil. And that's not at all the case. The ransom was paid to the justice of God. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation turns back God's wrath. It meets God's righteous, holy demand. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Now, why would God have to do that? Well, when we look through human history and see God's dealing with men, especially in the Old Testament, we see God forgiving and saving unrighteous men who deserved death. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. In the flood of Noah, Noah should have died. He was a sinner. God, you called Abraham and called him your friend, and yet he was a sinner. He did not believe you at times. Uh, he lied about his wife. When David committed the sin of adultery and murder, the law said he was to be stoned. That's why David didn't offer any sacrifice. There was no sacrifice he could offer. And yet when he prays that most beautiful, repentative prayer of Psalm 51, what does he appeal to? but the mercy and the loving kindness of God. And when God exposes David for his sin by the prophet Nathan, Nathan tells him, you'll not die, God forgives you. In that moment, the God of the Bible appeared to be unrighteous. Well, how could God save Noah, Abraham, and David? Because God's son died for all of them on Calvary. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Those men in the Old Testament were saved by faith. They were saved by faith, but faith in the saving work of God. The most troubling thing is when conservative exegetes say with certainty that's what this means. That solves the problem. That solves the crisis. Uh, I would just challenge you to look at the consistent witness of the entire Bible. From the very beginning of the Bible, it's clear that somebody has to pay a price for sin. Something has to die. In the Old Testament, we had the sacrificial system. The spotless lamb had to give its life for the sins of Israel. So God called for blood to be shed. And when the people trusted in the shedding of that blood, the promise of God for the forgiveness of their, of their sins, they were forgiven. Not because there was anything about that animal's blood that saved them, but they were trusting in the sacrifice that God had provided for them, which was a shadow of the ultimate sacrifice to come. There must be an atonement for us to believe in, and that atonement 
is the person of Jesus Christ. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. There's a God who loves some people enough that he'll save them while he burns everybody else. It's not really that good of news. Like, I could do better. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued from this God? How can you say that God has saved you? From what has God saved you? We are saved from God himself. And there's only one who can save from God, and that is God himself. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Salvation is deliverance from the wrath of God against sin. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. I like to say it this way. God has saved us from himself. God has saved us by himself. And God has saved us for himself. How could that God ever be good? How could that God ever be trusted? And how could that ever be good news? I'll never forget, I got a text from my friend. Did you see John Piper's tweet? And so I've looked it up myself. There was a famous tweet from John Piper that said, farewell, Rob Bell. And he, he came under a lot of criticism for this tweet. <coughs> Excuse me. John Piper is dismissing another pastor from Christian community? Or like, what does this mean? He's asking questions. Like, are we not supposed to do that? Uh, people like Rachel Held Evans and uh, other progressives said, you know, he, he didn't even read the book, and, and yet he's condemning Rob Bell. A lot of the people who seemed to have the harshest criticism uh, in regards to Rob's book had not, in fact, read the book. Um, he never takes a position in the book. He merely posts the question. But one thing that often gets left out of that conversation is that there was a trailer for the book in which Rob Bell basically denied the wrath of God. He denied core things of the gospel in asking questions. So to say, well, he was just asking questions. One thing I've seen over and over again in the progressive church is that sometimes there's an answer embedded in the question. This is why lots of people want nothing to do with the Christian faith. They see it as an endless list of absurdities and inconsistencies, and they say, why would I ever want to be a part of that? And so that's when questions actually become statements masquerading as questions. And I think that's what John Piper was responding to. Penal substitutionary atonement is something that I used to be um, so unbelievably committed to that I thought it was the only way to view God. Uh, the problem is when I started to actually learn the history, the payment model of Jesus' death on the cross, traditionally called penal substitution, is a recent development. You can find little hints of it in the early church, but it really came to the fore a thousand years ago, halfway into the history of Christianity. And then it became amped up even more 500 years ago at the Reformation. And so that set me on a bit of a search through church history because I wanted to know if what they were saying was true. Is this something that really wasn't a part of the earliest form of Christianity? The doctrine of penal substitution really came to its own in the Reformation and post-Reformation era, but that does not mean that it was not there in seed form, in embryonic form, and even in somewhat developed form earlier in the history of the church. Historical theology does properly develop over time. We have to understand what we mean by that. Everything is given to us in the scripture, yet as the church confronts various challenges and false teaching, it has to learn to become precise. This happened in the doctrine of the Trinity. The same thing is true in the atonement. Uh, the atonement wasn't attacked early on, but as time went on, there had to become more clarification and precision given to the nature of the cross. And so when we get to the discussion of the church fathers, we want to ask the question, not do they have a full developed penal substitutionary theory of the atonement, we want to ask, do they talk about the atonement having a penal and substitutionary aspect to it? And there the answer is actually really easy. In the early church, there were a couple other theories, uh, versions, understandings, interpretations of Jesus' death on the cross that were 
really popular, the most popular one in the first thousand years was what I call the victory theory. There's a dominant theme in a lot of the church fathers about the cross of Christ and his resurrection, and that is what we sometimes call Christus Victor, or at least that's what modern scholars call it. And this is a view, a classic view, that Jesus had victory over sin, over death, and over the devil on the cross. And we find this emphasis in scripture as well about this victory that conquered Satan, not just our sin. Hebrews speaks about it. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself also partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power over death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. This is a biblical view, this concept of Jesus as the victorious one. But to suggest that they held this view as some sort of contradiction of penal substitution is simply not true. See, this, this is why this penal substitutionary atonement theory begins with Calvin. That's where it comes from. It's 500 years old. It's a product of modernity. To demonstrate this, let me share a quote from Eusebius of Caesarea. And this guy lived a thousand years before Calvin. And you just want to listen to this quote for penal and substitutionary language. Here it is. Thus the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world became a curse on our behalf. He then stated, And the Lamb of God not only did this, but was chastised on our behalf and suffered a penalty he did not owe, but which we owed because of the multitude of our sins. And so he became the cause of the forgiveness of our sins because he received death for us and transferred to himself the scourging, the insults, and the dishonor which were due to us, and drew down upon himself the appointed curse, being made a curse for us. And so the idea that that theme of substitution is absent from early Christianity is demonstrably false. One of the biblical words used to talk about the atonement is ransom. <laughs> so it shouldn't surprise us that we have the ransom theory of the atonement. And in the early church, the ransom theory was very prominent. Jesus, in his own words, said, For the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Where the ransom theory started to go wrong was uh, this idea crept into the conversation that the ransom was paid to Satan, and that just doesn't make sense, and it almost puts God at the mercy of Satan. But if we understand ransom as a satisfaction of God's justice, well, we're very close to the substitutionary theory. But what they don't want to do is they don't want to say at the center, at the hub, at the very core of the death of Jesus Christ is substitution. Penalty substitution. There are substitutionary themes in various versions of the atonement. No question about it. It doesn't mean, however, that God is demanding a payment. The book and movie, The Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the C.S. Lewis classic, we have a picture of what may be that ransom to the devil view, where Aslan makes a deal with the white witch, you know, Aslan representing Jesus, the white witch representing Satan. He has to buy Edmund from the devil so that he gives his own life. The white witch, thinking she's conquered Aslan, is like, no, I'm going to just dominate. I've killed him. I can take over. But it's a, it's a big trick. And so after Aslan is slain, he uses the older law to overcome the devil and to claim victory. So now he has Edmund and the victory. Today, this view that Jesus paid a debt to Satan is taught by many in the Word of Faith, New Apostolic Reformation movement. They believe in what's called the spiritual death of Jesus. They believe that Jesus died two deaths, one physical on the cross and one spiritual. Now Jesus went to hell, oh, suffered the, the creeps. death of hell that no man has ever suffered. That when Jesus died on the cross, then he went to hell. Jesus goes to hell, I believe. He went to Hades, went down and descended into the depths of the earth for three days, and he pays for the sin of mankind. And he suffered, was tortured by the demons. The demons attacked him in hell, trying to annihilate him. And he was in that pit, just emaciated. What they're teaching is that Jesus' death on the cross didn't save us. What happened was he went into hell, and that's where he won our salvation. But that is not what the scripture says, and that's not what Jesus meant when he said it is what? Finished. Finished. When you 
carry this doctrine out to its logical conclusion, it's a very heretical doctrine because if Jesus died spiritually, then he never was God to begin with because God cannot cease to be God. One of the early figures who speaks into this greatly is Anselm. Anselm was a theologian and he later became Archbishop of Canterbury. And particularly, most wonderful, he wrote on the atonement in a book called Why the God-Man. One of the things that Anselm wanted to do is to reassert that, you know, the debt was owed to God, not to Satan. The one who destroys both soul and body in hell is not Satan. The one who destroys soul and body in hell is God. The judge is God. There's another version that came along about the same time as the payment theory, and it was developed by a theologian uh, named Peter Abelard, who said everything about God is love, and so everything in the crucifixion of Jesus must be love. It, it has to be ultimately about love. And so I call it the magnet theory. Others have called it the moral influence theory. And what Abelard argued is that when Jesus hangs on the cross, he's like a massive magnet. It, it's, it's an act of such overwhelming sacrificial love that he draws people into himself by that act. So then it ties right back into Jesus' Last Supper where he washes the disciples' feet and says, I've set an example for you now go do this for others. There, there was an earlier theologian in the early 20th century, James Denny, who used the example of a man sitting on the end of a pier and falling into the water and not being able to swim. Somebody runs and jumps off the pier and saves him and brings him out. And in that, risks his own life and, and finally actually himself ends up drowning but saving another man's life. Well, he's accomplished something. Even though it was at the cost of his own life, he's accomplished saving that, that man who's in danger. What if, on the other hand, somebody's sitting on the end of the pier, perfectly fine, not falling in the water, and some guy comes running along down the pier saying, I'm going to show you how much I love you by dying for you, and jumping in the water and just drowning. Well, that, that death doesn't show anything because it doesn't accomplish anything. In the first example, it accomplished the saving of that man's life, and therefore it showed a self-sacrificial love. In the second example, it doesn't accomplish anything and therefore it doesn't show anything at all. Well, I think that's the problem with a lot of these other ideas of the atonement when they try to stand without substitution. So none of the other images work if that one isn't true. It's the most fundamental of them all. It's the most central of them. You take that out, it's like Jenga, everything else falls down. The fallacy is to claim that one version of the atonement is dominant. That's the fallacy. His substitution in our place is essential for all those other beautiful images in the New Testament to have any meaning or coherence at all. There is a constant stream of misrepresentations, straw man arguments against penal substitution. Hey, God is less grumpy because of Jesus, atonement theory in 17 seconds, and much more... Others say that penal substitution requires we view God like a pagan deity who is mollified by throwing a virgin into a volcano. The God who is mollified by throwing the virgin in the volcano or the God who is mollified by his son being nailed to a tree is not the Abba of Jesus. Brian Zond is a pastor in Missouri uh, who wrote a book called Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. And what's clear from his book is that he hates penal substitution, he thinks it's a terrible, evil, evil doctrine. But what's also clear from his book is that he never actually interacts with penal substitution. He handles straw men and misrepresentations on every page and never engages with the biblical doctrine. Some years ago, I wrote a book called The Lost Message of Jesus. In it, I said, the cross is not a form of cosmic child abuse, vengeful father punishing his son for an offense he didn't commit. So there's a story about a father, a son, and a train that this is often used in youth groups to illustrate the gospel. It goes like this. There's a dad who's a switch operator on railroad tracks, and his switch house is way up on a hill overlooking the bridge. And so he brings his son to work one day, 
and his son is fishing near the tracks while he is operating the drawbridge and you know this drawbridge allows the ships to to go back and forth underneath it and so while the father is away for a moment the son notices that there's a train approaching and so he tries to warn his father but he can't find him and so the son attempts to lower the bridge himself but he falls into the gears of the drawbridge. And so this leaves the father with this horrible decision. He's, if he lowers the drawbridge, then the passengers of the train will be saved, but it will kill his son. But if he chooses to save his son, then the train will actually derail, and then all the passengers on the train will die. And so the father ends up choosing to lower the bridge, which saves the passengers on the train, but kills his son. His son is crushed in the gears. And then if the story is being told by a youth pastor who really wants to, <clears throat> really wants to twist the knife, I'll say, and as he looked in the windows of the train, there were people gambling and drinking and fornicating. <laughs> like They didn't even know the sacrifice that had just been made to cause them to you know, survive, to allow them to live. It's a very powerful emotional image. <laughs> and when it's used, some people have said, oh, no, that's a perfect example of what I mean by the abusive nature of this teaching of penal substitution and the death of Christ. To which I go, well, that shows the limitation of our illustrations. But particularly abhorrent is the penal substitutionary atonement theory that turns the father of Jesus into a pagan deity who can only be placated by the barbarism of child sacrifice, and this will not do. But what it completely misses is Christ's own voluntary laying down of his life. He was not like the little child yeah. trapped there unwittingly, you know, having his life sacrificed by his father <clears throat> with the good of strangers. But what they're forgetting is that God is triune, mm. that the Father and the Son and the spirit, they're all of one essence. That's been such a hard thing for and me to, they're all to grasp. Essence, they all agree in terms of motivation for the cross. It would be wrong to suggest that um, uh, the Lord Jesus is being subjected to a punishment for which he was unwilling. Uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, nobody takes my life. I lay it down willfully. He says, if I have the power to lay it down, he says, I also have the power, the authority to take it up again. Or that he, in turn, was seeking to coerce the Father to uh, display his love in a way that would be, if you like, breaking new territory. It makes God a vindictive monster. Does God really love me, or has he simply been paid off? The Bible... It's so helpful to us if there, we it, just read it, you know. It just makes... Uh, the most famous verse... That's why I love this documentary. It just breaks it down so perfectly simple. It, it, it doesn't make me question anything about Jesus and the sacrifice and the fact that we're sinners and that hellfire is, a, is, a, is an act of love. I don't know where to end this. I don't even know how much is left. This is such a good documentary. Um... Yeah, it's still got another hour. It's three hours long. Um, I would recommend buying it, and I would recommend checking out their YouTube channel because all of these are discussed um, on there. It's, I don't, you know, it's just going to, it's just, <laughs> and I'll be starting, I'm, I'm going to continue watching once I'm done recording, and I'm like, oh, I should do another video. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, another video I really want to do is on that other DVD um, on the, the gospel, just the gospel. Cause, uh, that's important, but, um, <clears throat> I love you guys. I hope this helps you guys and, uh, all of you will be in my thoughts and prayers and leave a comment, thumbs up. If you're struggling, because I, I get it, I understand. This is what this is about, to help with the struggle, to get over the struggle. All right, take care. Love you. Bye.